Welcome everyone uh, to our Science Outreach Athabasca virtual event. Um, just a reminder that we are recording this talk um, and we will later be posting it on our YouTube channel. Um, and right now you can um, already go and see the other talks that we've had since September on our YouTube channel. And I posted the link in our chat. Um, I invite you to participate in questions at the very end after uh, the talk. Um, you can either post questions in the chat or we'll also open it up. If you wanna open your microphone, you are able to do that as well. Um, we have an upcoming talk after this one, April 13th. 2021 um, called Amphibians in Our Midst by Dr. Dana Schock. And that will again be an online presentation. And I would like to invite Richard Loken to introduce our speaker for today. Good evening, everybody. And welcome to the Science Outreach Talk on the reality of fake science presented by Dr. Farut al Shabali. I must not, um, excuse me here. Oh, Farouk is an academic coordinator of the physics courses at Athabasca University and has teaching experience in both face-to-face -face and online settings. He received his PhD in particle physics from the University of Alberta in 1998. He joined Athabasca University in 2001 and has published in the areas of particle physics, geomagnetism, and physics education. He is active in the development of dynamic and interactive learning resources and in the application of mobile devices in physics home lab experiments. He recently initiated a research project to investigate the impact of online course design on student performance using learning analytics. I must now leave to don my Professor Dumbledore costume, so I will turn the microphone over to Dr. El Shabali. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. Can you hear me clearly? Okay, great. Okay, so as you can see from the title, I will be talking about fake science or false science or pseudoscience. Now the, the names are many, but I'll try to make the talk as much as possible relevant to everybody or relevant to our everyday life. So I divided my talk into these topics. So these are the topics that I'll be covering today uh, in my talk. So I'll be talking about the common myths, the examples of common myths that we have, uh, differences between science and pseudoscience, conspiracy theories. Uh, also, I'll be talking about different other definitions like the difference between misinformation and disinformation and uh, why some people fall for these informations and also what should we do about it. Uh, so, so let's start with this one. So this is one of the myths that some people have for, uh, which is that the earth is closer to the sun in the summer. Okay, we, we, we know that the earth rotates or orbits, uh, orbits the sun. And we also know that the orbit is slightly elliptical. It's not completely circular. So there is a period and during the year where the, where the earth is further away from the sun and six months later, it is closer to the sun than average. So some people believe that probably then it makes sense then if when the sun is closest to the sun, when the earth is closest to the sun, that would be summer. And then when it's away from the sun, it's, it's winter. Now, the problem with this, with this theory is that if this is true, then you would see summer will be worldwide. So the whole earth will be in summer. And when it's further from the earth, the whole world will be in winter. But now, as we, but however, the reality, our, what we know is that when the northern hemisphere is in the summer season, the southern hemisphere is in the winter season. So, so this, this observation immediately falsifies the theory. So we cannot accept this as a theory. In fact, the earth is furthest from the sun in July, and it's closest to the sun in January. And the difference between between the, the, the difference in proximity between between uh, July and January is about five million kilometers. Now the major cause for the seasons in the Earth is due to the tilt of the Earth's rotation axis. Uh, as you can see in this picture, 
the axis makes an angle of 23.5 degrees with, with the vertical to the plane on which the Earth rotates around the sun. So as you can see, and in this picture, the, 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 the summer is in the Northern hemisphere, while the, while, while the Southern hemisphere is in the winter season. And the reason why we have summer is because now there is more intensity. The, in, the intensity of the sunlight is higher in the Northern hemisphere and also the days are longer. So there are two factors that are contributing this and this is what causes the seasons. The proximity plays a factor, but it's very, very small. Now let's take another one. No gravity in outer space. So, so when you look at the picture of astronauts floating inside the, the, the spacecraft or, uh, or the International Space Station or outside, and you see them floating. So a lot of people, uh, uh, realize, uh, I mean, they, 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 they think that probably the gravity disappears when we go to outer space. So once we leave the Earth atmosphere, probably there, there will be no gravity. Now, is this true? So the question that comes now to mind is, OK, let's assume that one of the satellites orbiting the Earth just suddenly, for some reason, stopped rotating. What would happen? It would immediately fall down straight down to Earth, which means that gravity does exist. Actually, there is no such thing as zero gravity. So when there is mass, there is space, there is gravity. The forces of gravity are there. And actually, at the altitude of the International Space Station, for example, the gravity only reduces by 11%. So in the, in the station, there is a lots amount of gravity. So for example, let's assume that there is a post that extends 400 kilometers to the, uh, to the space station and you stand at the top of that post, you will feel your, your weight or your, the, the scale that, will, that you are standing on will only record about 11% less weight, but you will, you will, there, will be, there will be weight. The reason why we, why we feel weightless is not because of zero gravity is because there is your, you are, your presence with respect to the reference frame. If both of you are falling with the same acceleration or, or moving with the same acceleration, then in relation to that, in that reference frame, you feel weightless. For example, this is an example of, of how they simulate, the, uh, they, they simulate weightlessness closer to, the, closer to the surface of the Earth. This is a, an airplane. It goes to a certain height and then start falling freely while, while moving at high speed. So this is like a free fall. It's like, it's like an elevator, which is suddenly broke down and you are in the elevator and everybody, and you and the elevator are falling down. So both the plane and the, and the passengers of the plane, both of them are accelerated down with the same acceleration. So with respect to this reference frame, they feel weightless. So if they are standing on a scale, it will record zero. So there is a difference between weightlessness and zero gravity. Another myth, which is, I heard it a lot also, which is that microwave ovens causes cancer. And they connect this to radiation. They say, okay, now microwaves are a form of radiation and, for, and, and we are subjecting our food to this radiation. So there must, and we know that radiation is bad. So microwaves then are bad and causes probably some, harm to, to, to organs like cancer. Now, if you look, if you, if, you like to if you like to look at this one from a scientific perspective, now it's true that microwave is a form of radiation, but also visible light is also a form of radiation. And radio waves are a form of radiation. The, so all of these are called electromagnetic waves. It's a form of electromagnetic wave, which extends all the way from radio waves starting from radio waves all the way to gamma rays. Now, not all of this, not, when, you, when we say electromagnetic radiation, not all of them are harmful. There is a certain section after which the, 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 uh, the uh, electromagnetic becomes harmful. And in here we see that we know that starting from the ultraviolet rays, which are very short waves, and going even to shorter waves towards the X-ray and then to gamma rays, now you start becoming, these rays becoming harmful. But before that, they are not. And the reason because, the reason because, and the reason for that is that 
uh, when the frequency of these waves is less than is visible light or less or less than ultraviolet, these waves uh, do not have the ability to ionize atoms. This is why we call them non-ionizing radiation. So like light, for example, you can sit under light, or we, we live under light all our lives, and we don't think that uh, light waves are harmful. And light waves actually, uh, and if you, uh, microwaves are about 100,000 times weaker than, than visible light in terms, of, in terms of power. So in terms of being causing harm, like, uh, like causing cancer, for example, this is not, uh, this is not true for microwaves, not even for infrared, not even for visible light. So this is, so the, so the ability, so however, when you start going into ultraviolet, you go into X-rays, now these ionizing, which means that they, they have the ability to knock electrons out of the atoms. And when this happens, they might, they might change the chemical structure of some compounds, which, may, which might cause damage to your DNA. And this is why, these, uh, uh, this is, and this is why some uh, th these these uh, type of radiation are are harmful. And the more you go, for example, ultraviolet is harmful, but it is less harmful than X rays, and X rays is le even less harmful than gamma rays. Gamma rays are the ones which are usually produced in nuclear reactors or nuclear uh, nu uh, nuclear weapons. Now this bring this bring us to the question of okay, so what's the scientific theory then? Now, first of all, we need to understand that science is a human-made structure that attempts to understand how the physical world works. So we, we have the world around us, and we are just trying to understand it. So a scientific theory or a hypothesis, it must be testable, and it must be falsifiable. These, con these two conditions are very, very important. It, and what is more important than verifying a theory is falsifying a theory. So there must be a test, a test, at least in principle, to prove that a certain theory is wrong. Because you can, you can have a theory, which is, OK, it makes some predictions. OK, it made this prediction, and this prediction, and this prediction. OK, maybe it made 100 predictions. 99 of them, well, it, it came out to be as predicted. But then the, the, the 100th one, it came out wrong. Then immediately you know that the theory is not correct, or at least need to be modified. So there must be a test to test if a theory is wrong. And as, I, as Albert Einstein mentioned, no amount of experiments can ever prove me right. A single experiment can prove me wrong. So here is a theory that survived for centuries, actually, that heavier objects fall faster than lighter objects. And people believed in it for a long time, until the 17th century when Galileo was able to make a single experiment where he basically falsified the theory and proved that it's wrong. So in the, what he, he, where he took, he made that, he took, he, he con conducted an experiment where he dropped two objects that have different mass from the top of the, Eiffel, uh, from the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And notice that both of them hit the ground at the same time. And that was kind of a surprise to a lot of people. And that was that was single experiment was was able to falsify the claim or falsify the theory that survived many centuries. Here is an example of another scientific theory. You can you 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 saw a swan and you found that it's white. You saw another swan and you found it's white. A third swan and so it's white. So then you say that all swans are white. Okay, is this an acceptable scientific? It is an acceptable scientific theory. You can say that. And you, you, you might be looking at, you might look at thousand swans or even a million number of swans and all of them are white and the, the theory is still valid. Why? Because the observation of a single non-white swan is sufficient to falsify the theory or prove that it's incorrect. Now we'll, okay, so now in contrast, let's move to what is, what is pseudoscience now? Now we know what's a science. Now, what is pseudoscience? Now, according to the dictionary, a system, it's a system of theories, assumptions, and methods erroneously regarded as scientific, but it's not scientific. So they are disguised in science, but they are not, they are not science. 
most of the time you find it to be appealing emotionally. Sometimes you find it inconsistent. And it is, it's, and it's not, it doesn't go with the established scientific knowledge or process. And most importantly, it's not falsifiable. So it's, it, there is no, it's very difficult or it's, 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 there is no way to prove that this theory is wrong. There is no very so, solid prediction that can be made. And then based on that certain observation, you say, yes, this is, it, it, it matches the prediction or it is, it does not match the predictions. Uh, usually it relies on subjective validation. Believers, it's more of a belief actually more than it is uh, an acceptable scientific theory. Believers show little interest in criteria of valid evidence. Emphasis usually on, uh, on, on eyewitnesses that cannot be verified, stories, blurry photos, uh, messages shared on social media and all this stuff, but it is, which is not a scientific process of providing evidence for a scientific theory. Now, examples of pseudoscience, you have, these are different examples like astrology, uh, ESP, channeling, hypnosis, aliens, UFOs, Bigfoot, all, the, all these are different, different examples of pseudoscience. And a lot of them, they are making, a, they are actually a big business. And this is one, probably one of the reasons they, 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 they survived all these years, despite the advent, advent of science is that it's, it's uh, financially, it is profitable. If we take astrology, for example, which is the study, according to the dictionary, the study of positions and motions of celestial bodies in the belief that they have an influence on the course of natural earthly occurrences and human affairs. Now, this is astrology from a scientific, from the scientific community, it's completely rejected. It does not have any explanatory power other than chance. And there is no proof that there is no any um, evidence uh, that the position of stars or the motion of stars have any influence on humans' behavior and human psychology. Okay, now this is another type of pseudoscience, which is conspiracy theories. A theory that explains events or set of circumstances as the result of a secret plot by usually powerful conspirators. Now, usually supporters or believers in these, in these theories, they adhere to them despite any proof that you can provide otherwise. And usually thrives during periods of crisis and uncertainties. And we and just like these days when with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, this is a period where these conspiracy theories, uh, it's, it's a thrive, it's, it's, it's a fertile, fertile ground for, for, for these theories. Uh, sometimes there are political motives for, for the spread of these, of these uh, for such theories, sometimes repeated by politicians, activists, media organizations for political gains. Uh, also, some people feel a sense of relief that they don't have the responsibility for major port problems, uh, since they are basically they are done by external agents and we have nothing to do with it, so we are okay. So it gives some kind of a psychological relief. Uh, the for this is and th this is one side, and is that the. It, the problem with, the, with, with this one is that it gives people, people a, a sense of help, helplessness and they start becoming passive. And there is no need to, to worry, uh, there is no need to do anything because you cannot. It's out of your control. On the other hand, there are a certain group of people who, 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 start, to be, who start becoming radicalized and say, okay, now since we have this, these, these conspiracies and we have these theories and we have these evil agents, we have to fight them. And this sometimes leads to radicalization. And also these conspiracy theories, the problem, one of the, one of the reasons for it spread is that provide an easy target because sometimes these, the, the problems are so complicated and for people to solve a very complicated problem, sometimes it's overwhelming. So they, 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 they think this is an easier way to, to tackle or attack or put the blame on, some, on, on a specific, specific issue. 
Uh, this is another, another conspiracy theory which is floating around. And in the past few years, it, it's kind of revived and it, it, it gains some power, spe especially with the spread of social media. Uh, in this theory, flat earthers claim that Earth is a flat disk. The North Pole is at the center of the disk, while Antarctica forms a, an ice wall at the boundaries. And this ice wall is protected by the government and by NASA to prevent people from falling down. And then dismiss all evidence to the contrary as fabrications. Which is, you know, in science, you cannot just dismiss. You don't, you don't pick and choose with evidence. So, so this is one, one, of the, one of the issues. Now, as a falsification of this theory, we, we will just very simply, you can say, OK, now, if we, ex if we take it as a theory, for example, that it is flat, then you expect that the horizon will extend all the way. It doesn't matter how far, for example, a ship sails from the port. You will continue to see that ship. It doesn't matter how far, how, how far it goes, because it will be within your sight vision. Now, however, we know that when a ship sails from the board and moves away, it starts going down in, below the horizon. And we know that it's, it's a, and the horizon drops about five meters for every kilometer. So every horizontal kilometers, there is a drop of five meters in the horizon. And in this picture, you can see two ships. One is closer than the other. And you can see one of them, you can, you can see almost half of it is, is disappeared below the horizon, which is basically, this is, a, this is this by itself it can be considered as a falsification of that theory. Of course, we will not go to the to the predictions of the solar eclipse or the lunar eclipse with the minute with the seconds, but that's a different. But with, with this simple example, you, you can you can prove that this theory is wrong. Another conspiracy theory, which is also uh, has its supporters and a lot of supporters, and I know some of them. Uh, that moon landing is fake. And the doubters claim that NASA, the US government, faked this moon landing, which all happened, it, all, everything was filmed on Earth by, uh, by Hollywood. Now, if you think about it now, about more than 400,000 people were involved to accomplish the moon landings. Now, would, do you think this is, it's feasible to think that a cover-up would be possible for 50 years? It doesn't make sense. And probably even, even uh, for, first of all, I, we don't know what could be the motive to, do, to hide something like that and, or to fake it. And if we, if the, let's say the government wanted to fake it, it will be cheaper for them just to send somebody to the moon. <laughs> This is very expensive to, to silence 400,000 people. Global warming is not real, as some conspiracy theories claim, that it's just a natural change in the climate, uh, and that the science world is data and claims are all based on manipulated data. Also, it comes here to the, uh, to, to the conspiracy that everybody is part of that plot. And if you try even to disprove it, sometimes you say, okay, you are part of them. You are part of these people who are manipulating the data and making these false claims. And also these baseless claims that it's manipulated for financial and political reasons, that's, that's also part of, the, uh, part, of the, part of the conspiracy. And there's no, I mean, the issue here that no evidence is, 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 uh, is provided uh, is provided for, for these conspiracies. Okay, so this is a more recent uh, conspiracy theory, which is that 5G uh, technology, which is the upcoming, which is the coming technology for, uh, for mobile devices, is that it's a spread, it's the cause of COVID-19 or the spread of the coronavirus. And claims like, it it's weakens the immune system and boosts the viruses. And some terminologies even emerge like this, or this is, it's very similar to what we discussed about microwaves, that all this is electromagnetic radiation. It's, it's, and uh, it's causing invisible pollution, electrosmog. 
And the, the issue that also initially, especially initially when, when, when this one came out, was some support from some, some celebrities who acted like super spreaders of this, of this conspiracy theory. Now, some sub supporters, they use arguments like the timing of the original cases uh, of COVID-19 in Wuhan uh, and the launch of 5G in a number of Chinese cities, kind of there is a link between them and correlation. Even though this one is not true, first of all, this was not true because there were many cities that received it and many parts of the world other than China received 5G. Why did it happen only in that particular city? So that's, uh, but this is even if this is true, that's a correlation doesn't mean it, 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 it's, it's the cause. Uh, and the, the issue here is that people re rely on word of the mouth and also on social media for this. But if you go, for example, to the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection, which is an independent body responsible for setting guidelines on limiting exposure to electromagnetic field. I took this, uh, this one as a screenshot from their website. That's in April 20. Uh, they said that these claims are not supported by any evidence, not even extremely weak evidence. And the large body of scientific knowledge regarding electromagnetic fields relevant to 5G, those claims are not feasible. So it's very important when you get your sources or you get your knowledge to know who, you are to, who, who is uh, generating this knowledge or who is generating these claims. Now, I was watching a, 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 a video by BBC, and this is a screenshot from the video uh, on YouTube. Uh, and this was I, the date, the video date, July 14, 2020. Uh, it, it, was, it was about, it's a half an hour video, it's a very nice video, and I encourage you to, to watch it. And it talks about, the, about this conspiracy and the spread and the link between 5G and COVID-19. And it, they showed the statistic that 22% of the young, young people, 16 to 24 years, they believe that there is a link between 5G and COVID-19. And very interesting, what I, uh, I looked at the video that by itself and I looked actually at the, uh, because people will have the ability to rate the video and whether they like it or dislike it. And I looked at the likes and dislikes for this video. And I, if you take the percentage of the dislikes compared to the number of people who rated the video, it comes out to be 22%. So the, I found this as a very interesting observation. Another part of the, another version of the, of the COVID-19 conspiracy is that it's just a normal flu and used as a tool for population control. The virus was engineered as a pioneer. Well, and wealthy elites use it to profit from the vaccines. The vaccine is not safe. And, and, and the list goes on actually. Some of them even include Bill Gates as part of the conspirators uh, and so on. So it's, and, 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 and seeing that people are actually, a lot of people are believing in this and they are forming rallies and they are going out and they are uh, taking measures in order to oppose the sometimes vaccinations and sometimes uh, they all go against masks, which is actually is, is not helping in, the, in our fight uh, of the pandemic. So I thought I'd I talk about this one quickly, about this, the, the relation between science and religion. And because sometimes the issue, the, some of the mis, misconceptions happens is that due to improper interference between science and religion. And I, very, I, 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 I found this very interesting uh, quote from this textbook, which is uh, it's, it's, it's by, a, by a famous, by a physicist called, his name is Paul Howitt. Uh, it's a conceptual physics textbook. And he says that, Actually, science and religion, they work in different domains. So science is principally engaged in discovering and recording natural phenomena, while religion addresses the source, purpose, and meaning of it all. So basically, science try to address the question of how, while religion try to address the question of why. So domain of science is natural order, domain of religion is natural purpose. Sometimes, sometimes people try to put them in the same domain and trying to make improper interference between the, between the two and try to put them at the same ground as a competition. But I think, it's, I think this, I found this very interesting uh, uh, 
that we need to realize that these are working in different domains. This is part of the human's effort to understand the world we live in. Uh, okay, now we hear the terms misinformation and also disinformation. So what is the difference between misinformation and disinformation? The difference actually is in the intention. Now, misinformation is people now they have, they hold or they communicate inaccurate information with the belief that they, they believe that it is the truth, but it is not true. Now, disinformation is, 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 a, uh, is generated with the intention of causing misinformation. It's the, it's, it is, disinformation is, is generated in purpose. So the generator of, of, the, of, the, uh, of this information, they know that this is not correct, but they deliberately try to, to mislead the public through rumors or through fake information. This is called, the, so this is the difference between misinformation and disinformation. And repeating, sharing rumors, we know that it increases its power. Uh, this is another, another tool which is scientifically, it's very helpful to, to understand which is the relation between correlation and causation. Now, when you say correlation, which means that there is, there is, a, there is a, let's say a, a statistics of something that increases while this one increases, the other one increases. Uh, so now correlation, sometimes it is, when this happens, sometimes one of them is causing the other, but sometimes it's not. So it's not necessary for correlation to imply causation. I'll give an example. Let's assume that ice cream, we found that ice cream sales is correlated with homicides and drowning accidents in New York. So statistically, we found that if you look at the statistics of ice cream sales, the, and also the statistics of homicides and drownings in, in this city, you find that they are correlated, meaning that when the ice cream sales increases, also, the statistics increases almost at the same rate. And also, drowning accident increases also at the same rate. So can we conclude that ice cream sales causes death of people? Because this is, this is sometimes the logic used by in pseudoscience. Now, however, if you do, however, more, in, more uh, uh, precise or, uh, let's say, comprehensive research of this issue, found, you find the following, that on sunny days, there is more people are buying ice cream, more people go swimming, more people go out. So when more people go swimming, there will be more people drowning, more people going out, there's more homicide. So from the here, you can see that ice cream sales, drowning, they are not related. It's, it, they are correlated, but they are not causing each other. All of them are, are correlated with sunny days and caused by, by that. Okay. Now, why people fall for these informations? Now, one one of the issue, one of the problem, one of the issues that people need to be uh, you need to uh, you need to be aware of is is something called selective exposure. Now, many people they are overwhelmed by the complexity of the world, and the sometimes they cannot differentiate, or sometimes they they are. Uh, there are so many conflicting views and conflicting information that basically confuses the, it confuses any person. So what happens is that some people start, start favoring information that are consistent with when confirmed pre-existing beliefs. So they are kind of, well, this is called confirmation bias, where if anything that, they, so if there's a flood of information that comes their way, they start selecting those information or those evidence that confirms what they already believe in and brush aside anything which is to the contrary. Now, sometimes even providing information with the corrective information or factual information, it's not guaranteed to fix this mis these misconceptions, but it's very important to be, to be aware of this because this is always happens. The education system also is part of the, uh, uh, part of the factors that leads to these people fall in the, why people fall in these informations. Uh, now we know that students, when they enter the classroom, you because the, the old theory, 
the behaviorist theory, it, 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 uh, it, 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 it models the, 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 the brain as like a pot and the teacher it filled that pot with information. However, the constructive theory, which is the more recent one, no, it says, no, this is not true. And this is, and the reason is that what, this is why people do not live, learn at the same level. People already come with preconceptions, with already there is, there is a formation. So knowledge, you can, you can look at it as a structure within the brain of the student. And you need to help that student uh, to construct that structure in a proper way. But sometimes that structure in the plane already, there is a structure, but it is the wrong structure. Now fixing, fixing the structure, you have to engage with the old structure before you, you fix the new structure. You cannot just add your structure while that structure still exists. Otherwise, student will just memorize what you gave them, leave the classroom, put it in the exam, and they forget about it. So it's important to this is it's important when teaching science also to focus on factual factual uh, knowledge, uh, conceptual understanding, also engaging critical thinking. All of this will help in order to change that old structure or that. Uh, that wrong structure that the student has and help that student uh, build the new correct structure. Now, I like this, this quote for Harry Miller because this is sometimes true actually in lecturing because sometimes lecturing end up to be that way. Lecturing is that mysterious process by means which the content of the notebook of the professor are transferred through the instrument of the fountain pen to the notebook of the student without passing through the mind of either. Sometimes this is true. Now, in movies, it's important to realize that a movie is not a science project. A movie is a work of art or a fantasy. And the purpose of a movie is entertainment. It's not learning. Sometimes there are movies, they differ from, of course, there are movies better than other movies in terms of the science, scientific accuracy, but it's, Overall, we have to keep in mind that the purpose of the movie is to cause entertainment. If, the, if, the, if, if changing slightly the scientific accuracy will improve that, will, it will make more, the movie more entertaining, of course they will do that. Uh, for example, you find spaceships move and fight in outer space with spectacular sound effects where sound waves cannot propagate in outer space because there's no medium for the sound wave to propagate. Uh, when people jump from high speed in cars and trains and fall safe fall safely also this is this is not scientifically this is not possible social media now this is the the new tool that we have right now which is which we call so, social media it's a very effective tool for reaching a wider audience more quickly and we know that and the, the upside of this one is that knowledge is at your fingertips. So you can just, with a few clicks, you can find the answer to so many questions very simply. The downside is that also you can, it's a, it's a tool for spreading misinformation more quickly and more effectively. <laughs> And it, one of the things that social media did is that it, it, the dissemination of information is no longer top down. Now, peer to peer, anybody sitting down at home can take their cell phones, generate a story, share it, and it might go viral. And it's just a person who just made up a story. So there is no authentication, there is no peer review, Anybody can produce, uh, can be a broadcaster of information, and directly it goes from the from 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 a, from a person to another person to another person through the network. So what? So um, so for example, uh, fake information conspiracy theory existed for a long time. It has been there for a long time. But what happened now is that the social media provided uh, some a tool for amplifying. It's, it has the amplification effect. So instead of reaching 
uh, instead of talking to my neighbors and my classmates and uh, my colleagues at work, now you can talk the whole, to the whole world and very quickly. The other thing is that it helped form virtual communities of believers. Uh, because sometimes you, you as a person or me as a person, I have some weird, let's say, uh, weird views or, or thoughts, or I have some, my own uh, strange theories about something. Sometimes, most, sometimes you find it difficult to find other people who have the same beliefs as you. But if you, if you go to, if you resort to, to social media, most probably you'll find others somewhere in the world who support you in that, and you can start forming communities and these communities start growing. So how risky is fake, fake science? First of all, it can have serious consequences, especially when supported by individuals of agencies considered influential. So this is, this is one of the things, because as we mentioned before, when we talked about, uh, uh, about COVID-19 and 5G, there were some celebrities who each one of them have millions of followers. They retweeted messages in that, in that direction. And that well, and they acted like super spreaders and in just one tweet reached millions of people at the same time. So when, so influential people, they can easily uh, direct people in the wrong direction. One of the downside is also declining scientific literacy because people are basically are consuming junk information. You have the, you have the right information. It's like, so this is sometimes I say to my children, uh, people in the past, long time ago, used to have malnutrition because they didn't have food. Now, people have all types of food, but they still have malnutrition because they, they choose to eat junk food. This is the same thing with information. Now, the, 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 the healthy information is, is right there, but for some reason, it looks, it seems to be like junk information is sweeter, I don't know, but this is most of the time, this is what they are consuming. And then one of the, one of the, one of the downside, one of the problem or risk of this one is that people start to, they start to less trust in science. And also believers, especially believers in conspiracy theory, they will start also reduce their trust in democratic institutions and the democratic ways of making change. Uh, it distracts the public from the real problems, actually. Like, for example, uh, like climate change, social in social justice. These are problems, actual problems that near the real solutions. Now we are distracting people from this one to other things that are not a problem. Uh, and the list goes on. For example, now vaccine hesitancy, burning 5G towers in UK, and so on. You can you can you can do less of these uh, of these uh, consequences of. Of, of these uh, misconceptions and, and, and fake science. It's very, it's, everyone has a duty. And I, I, li I like this, this term, which is infodemic. We are living in an infodemic. So we have to help stopping the spread. So start with yourself, educate yourself about science and scientific process. It's very important. Learn and practice critical and analytical thinking. It's very important. For example, I'll just, uh, because sometimes this is, this is even, even some people that I know, these, they started saying all this COVID-19 is a conspiracy. There are some, uh, some it's, it's, being, it's being manipulated, it's being faked, it's being done for the purpose of, of control. My response, okay, let's assume what you are saying is correct. This is, it, it's, it's deliberate. It was engineered, it was done on purpose. Who did it? All the major countries in the world they are suffering negatively from this. Who did it? Probably a third world country somewhere. I don't know. So this is, I mean, critical thinking is very important in order to weigh any information you receive before you share it with, with anybody else. And develop an evidential style of belief. If someone claims something, say, okay, what's your, what's your, what's your evidence? Show me the evidence. It's, even if it's a celebrity who said that, it doesn't mean that a celebrity is an expert in that field. 
being a celebrity doesn't mean you are an expert. So always look at the source, check if the information received is consistent, because sometimes you have inconsistent, because sometimes it, it, these, these theories, because they are not based on a solid evidence, you find lots of inconsistencies. inconsistencies. They are not consistent with each other. Sometimes you find a piece of information is contradicting another one. Do not share any unverified information because correcting misinformation is not an easy task. It's more difficult to correct something that has already been uh, understood in the wrong way. Build self-immunity. And I will end up with, with this quote, which I really liked. See, I would love to have some magic cream that would melt away fat or mark or make wrinkles disappear, but how likely is it that such thing would be available only via late night commercials? So now this one you can you can judge it. For example, and you can apply it on, on so many things. Those please who, people who claim that there is uh, an I, an I, uh, UFOs, uh, there is a there is UFO that was spotted somewhere on Earth, or there are some aliens who visited the Earth. Now, how come these stories only appear in these fragmented stories on certain websites by certain people, while all these universities and research centers and the governments and spy agencies, all of them, they are not aware of it. It doesn't make sense. So why you are, you, you, for some reason, you as a person, you have the truth and all these people in the world or all these agencies who has the power to, to detect any any uh, any unidentified object in their in their, uh, in their in their in their in their land by the technology they have, but it happens that they don't and you do. So it doesn't make sense. And this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Al Um You guys can react with a. The little hand clapping thing or um so we are going to start our questions now um and uh there's one in the chat already um so i'll if you want to put some more in the chat while we're, we're doing this one then go ahead and uh we'll also pause every once in a while and ask if anyone wants to open up their mic and ask a question so the first one is from peter flynn and it is, I'll just read it. It says, isn't psychology a big factor in addition to education? I think of people addicted to false information as trying to make a statement such as I am different. I am rebelling against conformity. Hence facts don't get at the psychological need. Um, I hope I understand the question correctly is that uh, do you mean that uh, people are different and they, they should be, they should show their personality? Is this what you, you mean? No, Peter, uh, oh, sorry, I'll go ahead and comment. I'm, I'm Peter Flynn. The hmm. people, I think, sometimes have a need to be different. Uh, and so this is just a way to be different. It's a way to say, I'm not part of a pack. I'm different. I'm me. I'm not like everybody else. And so there's a psychological need that trumps any, sorry, bad choice of word, that triumphs over any kind of uh, factual basis because they have a need to differentiate themselves. Okay, so here you are entering to psychology, and I'm not an expert in psychology. But see, when, when, I'm, when I'm talking, when I'm saying that uh, people need to look at the truth, I'm not asking, uh, I, I mean, you, you, we, we do not encourage people here to, to become passive uh, followers of, let's say, the government, for example, because it's very important to be aware, to, be, to have your voice heard, because sometimes what happens in these conspiracy theories is that they make you passive and they, you direct your energies in the wrong way or they subsidize your energy. I know and people are different and this is, and, this is, and, 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 and uh, diversity is, is, is a beautiful thing. It's a very good thing. And we need to understand this diversity and we need to respect this diversity, but 
it's very important to also base it on truth, not to base it on, on fake information. This is the most important. Uh, we have a question from Dietmar Kennepel. Uh, do you address misconceptions and misinformation with your own students in physics? Yeah, for, first of all, I mean, online learning is different from face-to-face -face learning. Uh, but sometimes I think one of, the, one of the strategies for a teachers when they stand in front of the class, even when preparing online material, is, not, is to not to just be pure lecturing, because this is one of the problems, especially in teaching physics. You have, a, you, have the, you have the instructor sitting in front of the class for 50 minutes or 45 minutes, continuous lecturing, they, they leave the class. Now, lecturing, it means that you are just reading something to the students, and you don't know whether the students are accepting that or learning. So one of the ways is to engage the students. It's very important to engage the students. So for example, if you'd like to, let's say, uh, you'd like to address a specific concept, let's say in physics. Before you start talking about that concept, you should first of all ask the student, what do you think? So probably through the discussion, they might come out, they might, they, they might come with the concept itself and you just add to it. This way they are engaged. And this way you are engaging also their own, uh, their own perceptions. And sometimes when you are asking this, you start discovering the, the misconceptions because they start giving you answers that are indicators of what they already believe about this specific concept. So you start correcting that before you add uh, the corrections or before you teach them the new, the new concepts. Uh, so this, it's very important to engage the students and not to be just a passive uh, narrator of the subjects uh, at hand. Otherwise, students will zoom out they pretend to be listening to you. Some of them, they have good memory, they might memorize it, put it in the exam, and that's it. So there's a couple more in the chat. I'm just gonna ask if anyone has any questions they wanna ask live. Uh, you're welcome to jump in. I'll give an opportunity. Roland. I see your hand is up. Do you have a question? Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, thanks, Farouk. Uh, great talk. Um, the problem I see is that, you know, things are never really straightforward. And uh, you brought this very good example of the COVID vaccines. Now, for example, right now, we have these issues with the AstraZeneca where some people have a, 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 a real side effects and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tiny, a tiny, not even percentage of people that do have real side effects. And the way the arguments are brought forward is often um, very extreme, you know, uh, um, because we have these effects the vaccine is completely useless, is dangerous. I don't agree with that. Um, but uh, at the same time, we have to keep an open mind. Um, we have never had vaccines uh, that were uh, um, basically uh, used uh, after only a year. Normally, this takes years and years. And it's bound to happen that there are some issues um, the way this is, however, communicated, that's where I see the problem, uh, um, you know? So we have to keep an open mind uh, um, and we have to keep that critical thinking, but we should not think that because somebody addresses um, shortcomings that they are all conspiracy theorists. So that's, uh, and, and to find that balance, I, for me, that's the biggest problem really. Not sure I, uh, you agree. Thank you. Uh, see, I, 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 I don't disagree with you, actually. And uh, now, see, the, in, uh, this is the thing, the beautiful thing about science. Science, look at all evidence. 
I mean, it, it, there is no hiding of evidence. There is no hiding of information or data. And the knowledge also sometimes it's accumulative. Uh, as long as as we are we are trying to all of us trying to agree on on the truth on trying to find the right thing, we can put the pressure in the right way. For example, if there is information about about uh, about about some medicine, for example, it's very important for the government and very important for the or the scientific community to show all the details and to talk about the truth with the right statistic. The problem that it, saying that there is no side effects at all, everything completely safe, it's not true. It cannot be true. And also exaggerating the side effects, sometimes for political reasons also, we need to be aware of that because these, these, these things sometimes happen. Uh, to stay vigilant, look at the statistics, use common sense. So for example, when you know that about 12 million people in Britain were they already took the vaccine, if there is a serious problem, it would have appeared, for example. So that's, a, that's an argument that I hear, and I think it makes sense. So we have a whole bunch of questions in the chat. Um, so one from E. Owen is, um, do you think that social media flaming, where people post in their own echo chambers and get other people to like and reinforce them, is causing more people to be silenced? So people are posting in their own like little circles and then I guess other people would, would that cause others to be silenced? I'm not sure if I understand the question. <laughs> uh, it, is that person asking the question available to explain it further? No. Okay, I'll move on. And actually, Jim Swafield posted, and I wasn't sure, they said, yes, that is possible. I don't know yes to what exactly. Um, so Jim, next time, maybe when I open it up, you can comment further on that one. Um, Viv Kumar says, uh, this presentation is about fake science. Likely most of us here agree with your arguments. Are you aware of arguments that people make to convince others about the claims in fake science? Do they have logical sound and, co and cogent arguments in support of their claims? Okay, the problem that, okay. I know, I know for example, I know, uh, I know some people who believe in some of these conspiracies like flat air theory. I know in person some people. Now, the problem that here is that these people, when they believe, the, the problem that they, they believe, they have that these people have the, they lack the tools of, of scientific method and critical thinking. They already lack that. This is the, this is the main problem. So you cannot use this tool with them. They, what happens is that for them, they, it's more like a belief. And the, the more you try to, uh, the more you try to convince them, they label you as one of the conspirators. And they only look at uh, certain arguments that are in favor of their model. And all the 99% evidence against it, they just brush it away. This is the problem. So logical arguments with these people, most of the time, it doesn't work. OK, one from Shelley Borsma says, um... Some people are mistrusting media sources which have traditionally been considered reliable, such as the CBC or Global News. How can we encourage people to trust the traditional media sources which feature stories by actual journalists? Uh, well, I mean, following media blindly, I don't think it's, 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 it, it's it, because this is, when we say that you, you, you need to go to the sources, uh, a source must be credible. And the credibility of any media source is built over time. If they decide to start, uh, uh, try to, for example, using or uh, disseminate information that is not always co correct, and they try to lose the trust of the public, it's their choice. But I think the, 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 the community as a whole, they have a sense that 
this makes sense or does it make sense? I'm saying as a whole, there are some groups who are four for this one and four for that. But I think it's it's very important to you. We use our own judgments in order to in order to look at any type of news, regardless of the source. Over time, you'll find that certain agencies they have more you trust them more than others. For example, okay, if this one was if this one was let's say okay, this one is an article let's say in the Washington Post, you don't treat it like with a, with an article on as another uh, uh, magazine, which is you don't know from where it came. So because these, these you, you have more trust in this genre, which it was built over time. But if you start discovering that some of these, now this, this, this genre started to change its course and starting to move in a specific direction that you don't agree with, you might start, people, I, I would assume that you would start changing their mind or so start losing its credibility. But I, but I, think, I, but I think people should listen to everything. You should you should you should listen to the news. You should listen to the agencies. You should you should also see what you receive on social media, and you should be able with 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 some critical thing. You should be able to differentiate between what makes sense because there are so many things. I would say that I would say ninety percent of what you receive, a lot of the time you can say, well, this makes sense or this doesn't make sense, or I need more information here before I make a decision. And now, right now, if you if you uh, with, with the so the good thing about social media and and the internet is that you can search yourself. If you if you have doubts about a specific uh, piece of news that you you heard, let's say on global news, you can always go and search. And there is nothing that prevents you from doing that. And most of the time, you will be able to find for yourself whether what they claim is correct or not correct. But I think the most important thing is that you, as a person, you should have the tool. You should have the the filtration be able to to be able to develop a filtration tools in order to make uh, uh, to make to make the differentiation between what what is considered to be what makes what seems to be correct and what seems to be incorrect. Uh, this is sort of related question from Stella George. Vaccine hesitancy for some started with a fake scientific paper. What are the the go-to questions you ask yourself about validity of a source. So how do you make sure the source is <laughs> a good one? No, first of all, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not an expert in medicine or, uh, or pharmacy. Uh, but when you see that the majority of the respected people in medicine, and these who are, uh, let's say, specialists. Uh, like, for example, Dina Hansha, who, who comes on <laughs> almost on a, on a daily basis. Uh, they are all of them, uh, or, or let's say the majority of them, they think in a specific direction. You don't assume that all these people are ignorant. ignorant. And there is one doctor somewhere posted a video, is that person has the truth. Because this is how science works. I mean, you don't expect, like, for example, those people who believe in flat earth, they assume that there are small, very small circle of people around them, they have the truth, and 99.9% .9 of the world, they don't. It doesn't make sense. All right, are there any questions from the audience that anyone wants to ask live? Frederic has her hand up, and another. So I'll let Frederic, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Farouk, uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, trust the statistics or look at the, consider the statistics and, and uh, that you have to be equipped with the right tools to make those decisions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if we put that into perspective with a medical example, um, you know, I, I can give you a, a very simple example. At my first, third cancer, I refused the chemos. And the uh, oncologist, who is a big name in Canada, didn't understand my reasons. A week before, there was a, a major study that was published of precisely the chemo he wanted, he recommended to me. And in the conversation, he was saying, well, you know, it, it is increasing significantly your chance of survival, this type of chemo. And just the fact that he's using sig significantly you know, made it that I had read the, the, the study before going to the appointment. Even those experts sometimes lack critical thinking. 
they they have started statistics maybe in the first year before going to medicine for example and they have long forgotten <laughs> what those statistics really means uh when they read uh new research uh they kind of go quickly through it because they're so you know they have a so busy schedule anyway they don't even think about the details anymore once he go, went back to the to the study himself uh, after I talk about it, he, he realized indeed his mistake, trying to force me to get that chemo. What was significant in the study in question, it was the, therefore statistically significant, is that whatever they had observed in the study, okay, was indeed uh, a result of the of the treatment and not something random, right? But what was the outcome? In reality, over in average, over five years, you were surviving two months more. Okay, so <laughs> you know it was statistically significant. But do I really care about living in average two months more over five years when, on the other side, the side effects of those treatments uh, I have already experienced in the past? I know for sure destroy my life for at least a couple of years. Right. So when when he realized this, and indeed he agreed with me that uh, that was maybe a wise decision, my decision. Right. So, but it's because I play a lot with statistics as part of my research uh, in general. Right. And I and I've taught those statistics to to my students in the past, but not everybody is equipped with it, and even experts sometimes kind of forget uh, what it meant, really, what was in those publications and that is statistically related. So I think critical thinking is the best probably tool you can have, right? Very interesting. Uh, yeah, actually we have also, I mean, those experts are also humans. And the humans, they are not always right at this, they make mistakes and they have capacities for their learning, they have capacities for their uh, way of thinking or their abilities. Uh, everybody has, a, has his, his own or their own capacity. Now, and you are talking here about a, a, an individual uh, professor. So what you did here, you used your own judgment, your own thinking, and you started to use, read the article itself. So you, you resorted to information about it. And then you started to discuss with him what is in the article. Which is, which is the correct way to do things. Uh, another person would have probably rejected that because uh, a friend told him not to do it or because he saw a post somewhere. So this is what we are talking about. Now we have to look at the truth. If you have doubts, look at the correct information. Do not just listen to your friend or to your, uh, to your aunt or to your uncle. It's, you have to go to the source. You have to look at the information and follow the process of making the right decision. And, I, and for this one, I really commend you for, for doing that. And based on that, based on that information, you, the, you made a decision, an informed decision, which even you, as you mentioned, you even you corrected the, the who, are, who are supposed to be a professional in the field. Okay, we have someone else with their hand up. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, okay, this is Shokti Nil. Um, well, I totally enjoyed your presentation. It's quite very interesting. Uh, I have a, a few comments, not exactly questions, uh, kind of observations. The first is that uh, when you say that uh, social media is spreading, it's true, but at the same time, uh, history presents a lot of examples where you know people fought battles based on false beliefs and. Uh, there, there was, for example, also witchcraft, which was practiced in many countries until about 200 years back, and it is still being practiced in some other some countries. So uh, even without social media, it can be very, uh, it can uh, these false beliefs and these uh, these false uh, preconceptions, or you know uh, these conspiracy theories, all these can spread very very quickly, uh, but. I, I note that the social media has an advantage on the other hand in in the sense that you can you know uh, you can quickly reach uh, many people worldwide with the counter arguments and by showing the scientific facts 
So I'm not totally sure that the so social media is doing an extra harm. But this argument is, is put forward quite often, but uh, I'm not totally convinced. Although I see that it's, it's spreading via social media very fast, but then at the same time, it is also true that there are historical instances where uh, without, even without social media, uh, you know, evil things spread very fast and you know, with quite disastrous consequences. Uh, okay, so that this is one thing, and the other observation is that, um, well, it has it might have some correlation with the level of education and uh, and about critical thinking ability and all that, but it is also true that when you know these things may happen when the standard theories fail, when you say that mainstream media, mainstream standard theories, but the mainstream also sometimes fail, and then that could act that could uh, spar uh, conspiracy theories or false theories and you know false stories a very good very good example last year around this time all authorities were saying okay don't wear masks you don't need it anthony fauci also said it and who said it and then uh, there are different kinds of theories about well that the virus doesn't exist there are people who still think that the virus doesn't exist so it is. It has something to do with the with the mainstream as well, where the standard scientific facts or the standard standard scientific theories fail to explain reality. And the my third observation is that when you, we say that scientific facts, uh, there are many disciplines where there is the scientific facts or the scientific scientific findings are not static. For example, medical science. Uh, forget about social science you know things are a little bit uncertain in social science of course but even in medical science even 10 years back what we used to know as fact and you know after 10 years you know somebody will come and say oh no that was not right so this is a new fact and this is a new finding and you should follow this so yeah so those are my observations but i really enjoyed my uh, your your presentation yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree with you that uh, conspiracy theories and uh, even pseudoscience, for example, astrology is a very long, uh, it's, it's, it has been there for hundreds and probably thousands of years. Uh, conspiracy theories existed all the time. What I, what I, what, uh, actually what happened, the social media, the effect of social media is amplification. It has the power to amplify and, uh, uh, and increase the spread, uh, accelerate the spread of, of, of these information. And as I mentioned in, in that BBC video about, let's say, the uh, linkage for uh, link between 5G and COVID-19, I would I said not 22% of the young people believed it. I didn't, which means that 80, uh, I mean, 78% did not. Okay, so but still 22% in this age with this one is 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 a large number. And, uh, and there are some consequences that are happening uh, because, because of that. Uh, because the, the, the problem that a lot of people, especially young now, young generation now, they are more, okay, they are saying that, okay, uh, mainstream media is, 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 uh, is cannot, we cannot trust, we cannot trust the government, we cannot trust this, but now they are trusting others, just, uh, just uh, random sources on the internet. Uh, this is the problem that now most of these people now, especially dying one, they immediately go to the internet to look for the information and you don't know what source they are getting. And they take that as, uh, as, as a fact because they found it and they, and they say, okay, I, I found, I saw it on the internet. It means that it's true. So this is, this is, this is, this is one of, one of the problems. And sometimes they take it as is without making uh, uh, without making a judgment whether this one is, is it correct or not correct, or making some kind of research in order to see if this is valid or invalid. Okay, thank you. Are there any final questions for Dr. Ashtonali? And I will um, save, I'm not going to read the comments that are in the chat. There are some nice comments. I'll, I will save the chat uh, and share that as well. So those will get um, make their way to Dr. Al Shamali if you write something in the chat, a comment. But I will just say that. Um, Wayne, do you have a is is that a question? No, a comment. Okay, just a comment. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Wayne. Okay, uh, I think with that we will wrap it up. Um,
Thank you again, Dr. Ashmali, for sharing your time with us and presenting. It was really interesting and I enjoyed, enjoyed it very much and learned a lot. Um, our next presentation is April 13 um, with Dr. Dana Shock on amphibians in our mist. And uh, with that, I'll say goodbye and thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.